Good morning, and welcome to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. It is my great honor today, I'm Christy Bartles, uh, Division Chief in Rheumatology, and it is my great honor today to introduce Dr. Shivani Garg, one of our fabulous assistant professors in rheumatology. Dr. Garg joined the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics in the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health after completing her medical training at the top of her class in the Government Medical College of India. She followed with residency in internal medicine at Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, and then completed her rheumatology fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta at one of five US CDC funded centers of excellence for lupus care. <laughs> Additionally, Dr. Garg holds a master's in clinical investigation and research from UW and is pursuing her PhD studies. As a Founder of the UW Lupus Clinic with Dr. Tripti Singh um, and the Lupus Nephritis Clinic, excuse me, the founder of the Lupus Clinic and the co-founder of the Lupus Nephritis Clinic with Dr. Tripti Singh, Dr. Garg has been instrumental in cutting time to diagnosis, including kidney biopsies and eliminating racial disparities. She's recently celebrated a fifth anniversary in that clinic, and we were thrilled to have a celebration with Dr. Singh, Dr. Garg, Dr. Uh, Panzer, and Dr. Uh, uh, Sancha Ferguson, as well as their pharmacy and social work uh, counterparts um, who have really been instrumental in making this a full multidisciplinary clinic um, that's dedicated to improving care and outcomes for patients with lupus. This is the fifth lupus nephritis combined clinic in the nation and the only in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, it, again, it's one of, I believe five to seven in the whole country now. Um, so really, really Im impressive work there. And Dr. Garg is doing some collaborative work with the other clinics as well to really investigate the key ingredients to these combined clinics and their success. Many care metrics have been improved um, in Dr. Garg's clinic, including uh, uh, preventive care, um, vaccinations, and even prenatal care, which tells you how comprehensive the care is in that clinic. Dr. Garg has been a contributing author for more than 40 public works for nine book chapters, um, and she's been a PI or co-PI on six awards. Um, it's difficult here to uh, mention all of the accomplishments of Dr. Garg, but among them, she was also a champion of um, diversity and uh, equity inclusion um, for, and has been recognized through the Department of, of, of Medicine for her work, um, including the reduction of disparities in her lupus nephritis clinic. And she has really been also a critical component uh, of training our fellows and both lupus and also how to address social determinants. So please join me this morning. Uh, it, it, and actually let's one final accolade that I, I, I failed to have written here, but one final accolade is she's also been instrumental in helping to inform um, new quality measures for the American College of Rheumatology and Lupus, um, and now is helping uh, on the guideline committee for the lupus and lupus nephritis with the American College of Rheumatology. So with that, I would love to welcome Dr. Shivani Garga. She de delivers her um, talk this morning on precision care to improve in outcomes and reduce disparities in lupus and lupus nephritis. Thank you, Shivani. Thank you, Dr. Bartles, for the warm welcome and generous introduction. Um, it is good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to present Grand Rounds today. I have no financial disclosures. I wanted to start by share uh, by sharing one of my early clinical clinic experiences when I started lupus and lupus nephritis clinics. I want you all to meet my patient, Patient Z. She is a 30-year-old young, vibrant woman, mother of two, and currently in a graduate school. She came to for her routine follow-up visit, and during her visit, she was clearly not doing too well. She had rashes all over, leg swelling, and looked very tired. We started talking about how things have been going, how her medicines have been going, and patient Z uh, paused for a second. Then in a very low voice, she said, uh, replied to me that Dr. Garg, I know we had talked about these medicines, their benefits, but I had stopped taking these medi medicines a while back. I, I stopped taking medicines because A, I could not afford them, and B, even if I could find a way to cover the cost, I cannot afford to get blind. Uh, that very statement of patiency appalled me. And it got me thinking that how many other patients are in the same boat as patiency where they cannot afford their medicines or they, they don't feel confident in their decisions to continue the therapy and how we as clinicians could help patiency and several other patients in order to make healthcare accessible 
as well as make our patients feel supported and confident in their decision to start or continue lifelong therapies. The learning objectives and outline of this presentation um, will be, uh, we will focus on lupus nephritis screening. We'll talk about poor outcomes in lupus nephritis and lupus and potential underlying causes. And then we'll cover some gaps and advances in early risk prediction and risk management. And then finally wrap up by talking how uh, our group is addressing some of the non-adherence gaps and social barriers that are contributing to outcome disparities in lupus and lupus nephritis. Lupus is the most common autoimmune disease that disproportionately affects young women, uh, especially during their, um, during their reproductive years. We all have heard that lup uh, lupus pre commonly presents with cutaneous manifestations or arthralgias, but lupus can literally affect any organ of the body. The most common presentation, most common severe presentation is lupus nephritis. I will be focusing on lupus nephritis because it is one of the most common severe manifestations of lupus. Patients with lupus nephritis, up to 30% of these patients can develop end-stage kidney disease. These patients are, are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease, and the standardized mortality rate in patients with lupus nephritis is six times higher compared to aged match peers. And finally, all the, only 10 to 30% of the poor outcomes could be linked with genetics or biological causes. This, so let's start talking about lupus nephritis screening and evaluation. This table here highlights all the clinical manifestations that we can see along with prevalence rates in patients with lupus nephritis. The top three uh, clinical manifestations to keep in mind are proteinuria, microscopic hematuria, and impaired kidney function. So how do we evaluate a patient with systemic lupus for lupus nephritis? The guidelines recommend that we should screen at three different time points. The first being at the time of lupus presentation, second at the time of a lupus flare, and then third annually uh, for patients for during their routine annual uh, lupus visit. We screen our patients with serum creatinine, urine analysis, and urine protein creatinine ratio. If these tests are normal, no further testing is recommended. However, if these tests are abnormal, it is recommended to first rule out other causes, such as recent NSAIDs use, CT contrast was given, also characterized for urine sed sediment. What it means is to spin the urine and look for evidence of glomerular bleeding that can uh, be seen by uh, looking for dysmorphic RBCs or cellular cast. And the final step is to quantify protein by uh, collecting 24-hour urine sample. If the kidney function is still impaired or patient has elevated protein in the urine above 0.5 gram per day, a kidney biopsy is needed for diagnosis and treatment planning. One question might be coming to everybody's mind that knowing that proteinuria is prevalent in 100% of patients with lupus nephritis, why does a patient require a kidney biopsy? A kidney biopsy is required because not, not all kidney disease in patients with systemic lupus is lupus nephritis. Up to 5% of patients can have other glomerular diseases. There could be coexistence of other classes of lupus nephritis, and 24% of patients with lupus nephritis could have antiphospholipid syndrome-related nephropathy that warrants anticoagulation along with immunosuppression. Additionally, a kidney biopsy is a guide for treatment that could vary, uh, that could help a uh, good guide with treatment. For example, if class two lupus nephritis is noted without any other changes, aggressive immunosuppression for class two nephritis is not recommended. For class four lupus nephritis, which is diffuse proliferative or inflammatory changes in more than 50% of the glomeruli, aggressive treatment if, uh, is recommended if there is a lot of necrotic or chrysentric changes noted in the biopsy. Finally, if the biopsy shows chronic changes such as fibrosis and atrophy, then a different set of treatment or management is required for such patients. 
So now that we know how to screen our, when to screen our patients, how to screen them, the role of kidney biopsy, let's review the standard of care uh, treatment that we uh, use um, initially use for our patients with lupus nephritis. The treatment is divided into two phases. The first phase is induction therapy, where a patient gets started on hydroxychloroquine and a choice between cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. If the patient, uh, if the protein, um, if the patient is responding to the therapy after six months, maintenance phase is in, uh, started. If the patient continues to respond to the therapy and remains in complete remission, as uh, the definitions are noted below, uh, at after thirty six months of therapy, or um, one could consider slowly tapering the therapy. However, if the patient is partially responding to therapy, then either one could continue therapy for a longer duration, or there is evolving evidence to support a repeat biopsy to look for histological evidence of activity to guide with a further continuation or treatment planning. However, if the patient does not respond to induction therapy or gets worse, then an alternative induction therapy is required. If the patient starts responding to this medication, then we could follow the, uh, the steps that we just discussed. However, if the patient remains to uh, remain, uh, continues to get worse, at this point, the disease is considered to be refractory and salvage therapy is initiated. And um, there could be a role of repeat biopsy if the patient continues to remain refractory to several therapies. So now that we have talked about uh, how to screen our patients, role of kidney biopsy, standard of care treatment, the question that comes to our mind is that how are we doing in regards of uh, current management in regards of outcomes? This brings to our second section of the presentation, poor outcomes and potential underlying causes in lupus nephritis. The first poor outcome that I will be reviewing is response rate. The table here summarizes one-year complete renal response rate from recent clinical trials using the standard of care arm. The standard of care arms uh, use mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide, the therapy that we just reviewed a few slides back. And, we know, uh, and the study noted that complete renal response rate uh, in standard of care arms was as low as 30%. On summarizing the findings, they noted that one-year complete renal response rate using mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide was as low as 34 to 35%. This brings uh, up a really important question that if the patients are not achieving complete remission or response in their uh, kidneys, what does it mean or what does it implicate in regards of their kidney function over time? This brings to our second poor outcome um, for today that, uh, that I wanted to review is end-stage kidney disease risk in patients with lupus nephritis. The study I chose to review is a meta-analysis that included 187 studies with 18,000 plus patients with incident lupus nephritis, and these studies spanned over four decades. The stu these studies looked at five, 10, and 15-year ESKD rates uh, shown in red, green, and blue uh, lines, respectively. And they overall, uh, they noted that the overall ESKD risk across all classes of lupus nephritis uh, declined from 35% to 18% in 1970s to 1990s. Thereafter, in the late 2000s, there was a slight increase in e ESKD risk to 22%, uh, followed by a slight decline in 2015. However, if we look particularly at that class four lupus nephritis where there is diffuse inflammation in the uh, most of the glomeruli, the ESKD risk increased in 2000s and remained high at 44%. The other poor outcome that I wanted to review is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, uh, we used our Georgia Lupus Registry, which is population-based incident cohort with 336 patients with incident lupus or lupus nephritis. We calculated 15 years ASCVD rates in these patients. And we noted that the number of ASCVD events peaked during the second year of lupus or lupus nephritis diagnosis. 
And what was striking was that the mean age at time of their first ASCVD event was only 36 years. Our study, along with several other studies, noted that the ASCVD risk in patients with lupus nephritis compared to age match healthy peers was four to uh, nine times higher. We have also noted that ASCVD risk starts early, as early as within the first two years of lupus, nef lupus or lupus nephritis diagnosis. Moreover, young patients below age 40 have 44 times higher risk of having a cardiovascular disease event compared to aged match healthy peers. And finally, our study noted striking racial disparities in ACVD occurrence uh, a, using our population-based incident cohort from Georgia. The final poor outcome that we will be reviewing is mortality. I will be reviewing another population-based cohort uh, uh, study that recently got published. This is a lupus Midwest, uh, Midwest network population-based cohort with 72 incident lupus nephritis patients who were followed over four decades. The ten -year, uh, they looked at 10-year mortality rate, and they noted that the observed survival rate or uh, the observed survival rate in patients with incident lupus nephritis was significantly lower compared to expected survival rate for uh, patients in that age group. They noted that the 10-year standardized mortality rate was six times higher in patients with lupus nephritis, and it climbed to 12, and it was 12 times higher in patients with lupus nephritis below age 40. What was the most striking finding was that over four decades, there were no changes in mortality trends or rates in patients with lupus nephritis. This, this is quite a this brings up a lot of questions in our mind about like, why are we seeing all these poor outcomes in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis? There could be several uh, put, uh, causes for poor outcomes. And uh, however, we will be focusing on three key uh, causes in this um, presentation. The first being lack of early risk markers that could guide timely prevention or timely risk management in patients with lupus nephritis and lupus. This could explain that why less than 15% of eligible patients receive timely risk-reducing therapies. The second cause could be lack of optimal dosing and lack of optimal medicines that creates uh, confusion in patients' minds, uh, make them uh, feel less confident uh, in their decisions to continue therapy leading to non-adherence that triggers flares and drives poor outcomes. And finally, uh, we will talk about uh, upstream social barriers such as access to care, in between insurances, unstable housing, how all these social barriers drive poor outcomes and uh, widens the health disparities gap that we are seeing in lupus and lupus nephritis. So this brings to our third section of the presentation to, uh, to start talking about uh, gaps and advances in early risk uh, prediction in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. In order to understand gaps in ASCVD risk prediction, let's take a case scenario. I will be taking a case scenario where we are trying to calculate ASCVD risk estimate for a patient with lupus nephritis who's 45 years old, is a smoker with normal cholesterol and elevated blood pressure. If we use the traditional ASCVD risk calculator, we note that the estimated ASCVD risk is 3.2%. This risk is one-tenth the observed ASCVD risk that we see in patients with lupus nephritis. This clearly highlights a gap in ASCVD risk estimation using traditional risk factors and risk calculators. And it also highlights the need for specific and early ASCVD risk factors for all patients with lupus nephritis and lupus. So this got our group thinking that what are some of the universal facts known in ASCVD science and how we can leverage those facts in lupus nephritis. That one universal fact that is known in ASCVD science is that sub -peripheral, a subclinical peripheral arteriosclerosis predicts future clinical ASCVD events. This got our group thinking that what is that one common thing that most of the patients 
would lupus nephritis undergo at the time of di uh, diagnosis and could contain renal arteries? If we are thinking kidney biopsy, that is correct. More than 90% of patients undergo a kidney biopsy to, for diagnosis and treatment planning uh, of lupus nephritis. So the research question was straightforward. That could changes in renal arteries in a kidney biopsy at lupus nephritis diagnosis predict future clinical ASCVD event risk? To do so, the first step uh, for our group was to understand the burden of renal arteriosclerosis in patients with lupus nephritis. We used our incident biopsy proven lupus nephritis cohort at UW uh, including 189 patients, overread all biopsies using BAM criteria, and then compared renal arteriosclerosis grade in patients with lupus nephritis with aged match healthy donors. We noted that not, uh, patients with lupus nephritis not only had higher prevalence of renal arteriosclerosis, but we, know, we also saw that uh, renal arteriosclerosis was prematurely accelerated by two decades in lupus nephritis compared to aged match healthy donors. We additionally, renal arteriosclerosis grade was significantly higher in patients with lupus nephritis compared to healthy donors. Uh, with this step, we were able to conclude that renal arteriosclerosis is prematurely accelerated in patients with lupus nephritis, and patients with lupus nephritis have more bur higher burden and severe grade of renal arteriosclerosis. The next step was to then um, look at associate renal arteriosclerosis that is present at the time of lupus nephritis diagnosis with future clinical ASCVD risk. Using our uh, cohort with 18 years of follow-up data, we noted that patients who had renal arteriosclerosis in their kidney biopsy at time of diagnosis, they had two times higher risk of having a future clinical ASCVD event. When we excluded patients with chronic kidney disease stage 3 and above, recognizing that CKD stage 3 and above is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease events, we again noted that even in this low-risk group with preserved kidney function, uh, renal arteriosclerosis still was associated with two times higher future ASCVD risk. The final step was to then see if we can add renal arteriosclerosis to our model and see if the ASCVD risk prediction improves um, in lupus nephritis. After including renal arteriosclerosis to our model with traditional risk factors, we note, uh, noted that the area under the curve improved from 0.65 to 0.76. Additionally, specificity improved uh, from 68% to 82% after adding renal arteriosclerosis to traditional risk factors. Based on all these findings, we were able to conclude that systematic grading of renal arteriosclerosis in lupus nephritis biopsies at diagnosis can identify patients at higher ASCVD risk who could benefit from timely ASCVD prevention. Now we are testing our findings across diverse populations. One question that might be coming to our mind is that if patients, not all patients with lupus nephritis or uh, get a kidney biopsy, approximately 10% of patients are unstable to undergo a kidney biopsy. Moreover, what about patients with systemic lupus, but without nephritis, who do not get kidney biopsy on a routine basis? So we, uh, we could consider um, our group thought about uh, looking at surrogate biomarkers of endothelial damage in blood for these patients. While there could be several uh, surrogate biomarkers as highlighted in this diagram, our group was particularly focused in these M2 macro macrophages, which are tissue precursors of uh, plaque, for, uh, plaque formation and plaque destabilization. Moreover, we were more interested in the blood uh, precursor of M2 macrophages, which are non-classical monocytes. These non-classical monocytes are circulating in the blood and they enter into the tissue, they convert into M2 macrophages, leading to plaque destabilization. So the question might be coming is that, what is the data behind non-classical monocytes for CBD risk prediction? 
The data is premature but promising, and the study that I chose to review is uh, included 109 patients with lupus, uh, systemic lupus, and compared findings with control population. The authors noted that patients who had um, patients with lupus had two times higher non-classical monocytes propo monocyte proportion compared to patients' control population. Additionally, authors noted a negative correlation between monocytes and HDL or good cholesterol. They noted that when they used a ratio of monocyte HDL, MHR, uh, that ratio was higher in patients who had clinical, subclinical CVD event or uh, they had uh, CV risk factor, CVD risk factors. After including MHR to the, uh, to the uh, lupus disease activity index and age model, the area under the curve improved to 0.825%. This data does uh, show promising uh, that monocytes could be promising surrogate biomarkers that could predict future ASCVD risk in patients with lupus, but we need to uh, test them, uh, test this biomarker across diverse populations, and specifically in patients with lupus nephritis who face two to nine times higher risk of cardiovascular disease events compared to patients with lupus without nephritis. The final risk prediction method is could be imaging, and I will be focusing on CT calcium scoring. In, in this meta-analysis that included 24 studies, a, including 918 patients with lupus and compared with approximately 4,000 control, control, control patients, they noted that patients who had abnormal calcium scoring, um, abnormal calcium score, uh, scoring was associated with two times ASCVD risk in patients with lupus compared to controls. Despite the high negative predictive value of CT calcium scoring, um, it is still not routinely used in um, during lupus visits. That could be uh, because of cost coverage, radiation exposure, but more importantly, we don't still don't know who should get it, how often patients should get it, and when should we get a CT calcium scoring. So the next logical steps are to longitud longitudinally examine um, the role of CT imaging in uh, risk management and response to therapy in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. So now that we uh, know the gaps and how the gaps are being bridged by uh, advances in early risk prediction, the next step is to learn about risk-reducing therapies. We will be reviewing three key risk-reducing therapies, starting with hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is the pivotal therapy in lupus management because it improves disease-free and damage-free survival in all patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. In this observational study that included 4,500 patients, 4,000 uh, plus patients with lupus followed over 20 years, the authors noted that patients who were taking hydroxychloroquine, they had 33% lower cardiovascular disease risk compared to non-users. Moreover, um, they noted that there was a 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease-related death compared in hydroxychloroquine users compared to non-users. Additionally, there was a significant reduction in all-cause mortality in hydroxychloroquine users. This study, along with several other studies that are cited on this slide, highlight that hydroxychloroquine uh, promises better outcomes in patients with lupus because it prevents flares, protects organs, reduces cardiovascular disease risk in patients, reduces blood clot risk, and overall prolonged survival in all patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. The second uh, risk-reducing therapy that we will be discussing is angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor. ACE inhibitors, uh, the, uh, the, study is, uh, the study I chose to review is an observational study with 220, uh, 200,000 plus patients. And the authors noted that patients who were on ACE inhibitors, they had better survival probability compared to patients who were not on ACE inhibitors. Moreover, they noted the relative cardiovascular disease risk with uh, ACE inhibitor use was 0.62 compared to non-users. After adjusting for propensity scores, 
Again, the authors noted that the relative risk of cardiovascular disease was significantly lower uh, for uh, ACE inhibitor users compared to non-users, and uh, it was lower across all CVD subtypes. We noted similar, our group noted similar findings in uh, patients with lupus nephritis using our incident cohort and found that um, use of ACE inhibitors in patients with lupus nephritis uh, over five years reduced the risk of having a cardiovascular disease event by 69%. Both data combined highlight that ACE inhibitors could improve outcomes in patients with lupus and all patients with lupus nephritis. The final study that I wanted to review is an SGLT2 inhibitor, and the data is fresh uh, from our last uh, national conference uh, in 2023, and it, the study was presented as a plenary presentation. The study included 96,000 plus patients across 46 centers and looked at use of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with lupus and diabetes. They noted that patients who were on SGLT2 inhibitors shown in a blue line, they had less cardiovascular disease, disease events and less renal progression compared to patients who were not on. So clearly, SGLT2 inhibitors could promise better outcomes in patients with lupus and diabetes, but we need to validate these findings in patients with lupus without diabetes and particularly in patients with lupus nephritis. This slide bring, uh, is a nice summary slide for all that we have discussed so far um, uh, regarding monitoring, uh, including lupus nephritis screening, cardiovascular disease screening, and risk reduction with different therapies that we went over. The final two small sections include uh, how our group is addressing non-adherence to improve outcomes, and um, we have all talked about that hydroxychloroquine is the pivotal therapy uh, for lupus management, but adherence to hydroxychloroquine is just small. Hydroxychloroquine non-adherence is a critical gap as it leads to 27% in higher ESKD risk, three times higher hospitalization, and eight times higher mortality. A question that is coming to our mind is that why do patients stop taking medicine? In order to understand this better, our group went back to our patients in order to understand their lived experience with their medicines, what concerns them, what are their fears that lead to premature self-discontinuation of the therapy, what are the motivators to take it. This word cloud highlights all the top key reasons that the patients reported as uh, to stop, uh, stop hydroxychloroquine. The two top reasons that stuck out were that one, patients reported unanimous, unanimously that they were not aware about the survival benefits of hydroxychloroquine. Second, uh, that patients wanted a better way to see if hydroxychloroquine is effective, is in the safe zone, and it is working for them. So this got our group to uh, develop two different strategies to optimize drug use, um, one being therapeutic drug level monitoring, and second being shared decision-making. Let's start by talking about therapeutic drug level monitoring. We need therapeutic drug level monitoring because the optimal dosing of hydroxychloroquine is controversial. Where we do, if we dose, uh, give higher doses, the risk of eye toxicity increases but if we give lower doses, patients are at two to six times higher risk of having lupus flares that can put them in the hospital and lead to poor outcomes. This conundrum could be addressed by therapeutic drug level monitoring. Additionally, therapeutic drug level monitoring could help us guide a pre uh, with precise dosing. Let's look at the status quo of hydroxychloroquine dosing. Currently, hydroxychloroquine dosing is only based on body weight. This dose is then absorbed in the body, gets into the blood, that gets to the target site, producing a clinical effect. However, this current status quo does not take into account several clinical variables such as kidney function, drug and dose interaction, and cellular metabolism, all that can affect absorption and clearance, thereby affecting blood and target site levels, and they need to be taken into consideration for hydroxychloroquine dosing. 
which can, so therapeutic drug level monitoring could help us account for all these clinical variables and then guide our dose based on the levels that we say. To do so, or to uh, get started with therapeutic drug level monitoring, the first question that I, our group aimed to answer was that what is a reference range or an effective range for hydroxychloroquine blood levels? For this, we used our, our uh, prospective lupus cohort with 158 patients who were followed over nine months. We noted that the optimal cutoff lies around 750 nanogram per ml, and then using spline regression analysis and setting the cutoff at 750, we noted a steep decline in estimated odds of active lupus until levels of 1200 were achieved. After achieving 1200 or with levels above 1200, no significant reduction in odds of active lupus was noted. We were able to conclude that the therapeutic range of hydroxychloroquine blood levels lies between 750 to 1200, and we cross-validated our findings uh, with Dr. Kostaduot's cohort that included 1,224 patients. We also noted that when levels are in the therapeutic range, the odds of having active lupus is 71% uh, lower. And maintaining levels in therapeutic range reduced the risk of lupus flares by 26%. The next step was to see if maintaining levels in the therapeutic range could improve poor outcomes in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. The poor outcome that we were looking at was acute care utilization. We noted that when uh, levels were maintained in the therapeutic range, 73% lower acute care utilization was noted compared to when levels were subtherapeutic. In our cohort, we noted that race and insurance when used as proxies for social barriers, they were associated with three to four, five times higher acute care visit utilization. Our group thought about doing uh, some subgroup analysis in looking uh, for uh, role of maintaining therapeutic levels in tailoring therapy and reducing health disparities. What we noted was interesting in both subgroups, including only people of black race and only people of uh, public insurance separately, that maintaining therapeutic levels reduced uh, uh, acute care utilization by 80 to 95%. Therefore, we were able to conclude that hydroxychloroquine blood level monitoring promotes tailored precision care, thereby reducing health disparities in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. Additionally, we also lo looked at cost effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine blood level monitoring. We noted that 10 times higher costs were spent on preventable acute care visits in subtherapeutic level category compared to uh, the cost spent in, uh, on acute care visits in the therapeutic level category. The cost that could have been saved with therapeutic drug level monitoring, approximately 40,000 over six to 12 months for our small study, that could have covered cost for hydroxychloroquine blood level monitoring for 200 to 800 patients over an year. So hydroxychloroquine blood level monitoring is not only effective and helps tailor precision care, but it is also highly cost effective. Our current guidelines uh, highlight that we could re we should recent uh, we should routinely measure when available hydroxychloroquine blood levels. This is a drug monitoring intervention that our group developed, which guides the clinicians how to approach subtherapeutic and supratherapeutic levels. Um, and the next steps are to longitudinally assess uh, its effectiveness and to link hydroxychloroquine levels with tissue toxicity monitoring. Before we switch gears and talk about uh, social barriers, I wanted to sh share this um, decision-making tool that our group uh, developed for personalizing discussion and making uh, helping our patients feel supported in their decision to continue the therapy. ETSIQ Safe is a pictogram-based um, shared decision-making tool that has five lupus outcomes of interest, four that highlight life-saving benefits, and then one um, page highlights um, harms with the medicine, including eye toxicity and other concerns. The uniqueness of HCQ Safe is that it helps clinician tailor discussion based on individual patients' concerns um, 
and fears so that we can address those during the clinic visit and help patients feel confident and supported in their decisions to continue or start therapy. ETSIQ SAFE in our pilot testing has shown to be a feasible and effective tool. In interest of time, I will not go over all the key uh, findings of, from our pilot testing, but want to just highlight two key things that on, on an average, ETSIQ, it only took eight minutes for a clinician to review ETSIQ SAFE with their patients and address all their concerns and decision conflicts. Median time spent was around six minutes. And moreover, we noted that all decisional conflicts when identified were resolved with use of ETSIQ SAFE. Therefore, we were able to conclude that ETSIQ SAFE is an effective tool that improves patient clinician communication, improves patient's knowledge, and clarifies misbeliefs. The next steps are uh, to test our Spanish and E versions across diverse uh, clinics. Um, so stay tuned for those findings. And this is a link to our e-version. So uh, please feel free uh, to start using the tool. The final four slides are on um, our group's work on um, how we are battling upstream social barriers that create disparities and how we can address those to improve outcomes and reduce disparities. We all might be aware of social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are conditions in which we live that affect our health and health outcomes. These can include socioeconomic factors, physical environment or community and neighborhood, health behaviors, and healthcare. Um, our group was particularly interested in healthcare, looking at access to healthcare and, um, and timeliness to diagnosis. The study that we first designed was to look at delays in lupus nephritis diagnosis at our institution. Using our biopsy proven cohort, we noted that on an average, a patient was waiting for 60 days, two months to get diagnosed with lupus nephritis. Moreover, the wait times were two times longer for people of black race. For patients who had reported other social barriers such as lack of transportation, or access to care or affordability, they had 54 times higher risk of having delays uh, to diagnosis. This got us thinking that how we could address some of these upstream barriers and help uh, give a comprehensive care to our patients and also make care, uh, precision care accessible to most of the patients with lupus nephritis. Therefore, our team put together a multidisciplinary lupus nephritis clinic in which we have a rheumatologist, we have rheumatologist, nephrologist, pharmacist, and social workers who all see the patient on the same day of the visit and help um, make uh, and make it possible to have accessible care and access to precision care and address some of the upstream social barriers. How are we doing um, since implementing our lupus nephritis clinic? Our clinic just celebrated its five-year anniversary, and we are proud to report that the time to diagnosis is now only two to three weeks. Additionally, the likelihood of getting a timely diagnosis is two times higher in, uh, in lupus nephritis clinic. And finally, our, with help of our pharmacists, skilled nurses, and our social worker, we have been able to address uh, a lot of uh, several social barriers such as unstable housing, food insecurity, um, in between insurances, financial assistance, cost coverage, et cetera, to uh, reduce health disparities. The next step is to look at uh, some of the uh, other national initiatives uh, or other initiatives across the country and see what, uh, how, um, their success stories, and also barriers that they are experiencing uh, in order to have a comprehensive understanding of uh, facilitators of such initiatives. But on a bigger picture on a, uh, or for a bigger lens, the idea is that could we get, uh, help provide such a precision care or make it accessible for most of the patients with lupus nephritis, uh, make such care accessible to, uh, for most of the patients with lupus nephritis. 
With that, this is the last uh, slide of my presentation and key uh, summary points. Uh, we talked about lupus nephritis, which is the most common severe life-threatening manifestation of lupus um, and why a kidney biopsy is needed for diagnosis and treatment planning. And also some interesting data to show that a kidney biopsy could guide with future ASCVD risk prediction. We talked about timely risk reduction uh, therapies focused on hydroxychloroquine and ACE inhibitors and potentially SGLT2 inhibitors. We talked about uh, strategies to address non-adherence and help our patients feel supported in their decision to continue therapies and some of our work, how we could um, on battling upstream social barriers and improving outcomes and reducing health disparities. With that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, want to thank my mentors, collaborators, my clinic teams, especially my lupus and lupus nephritis clinic teams, and uh, my co-director of lupus nephritis clinic, my research team, my patient clinician advisors, uh, my patients in UW lupus and lupus nephritis clinics, because without their support, a lot of these studies would not have been possible. And sincere thank you to our funders for believing in our research and supporting our research. Thank you once again, and happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Garg, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I really appreciated the breadth of uh, the studies that you you presented here, um, which really represent a, a tremendous body of work that you're doing uh, on your ICTER KL2 and, and beyond. Um, I, I also love that you highlighted your other two deal Department of Medicine mentors, Dr. Brad Astor and Dr. Amish Raval, who've helped in this work. And again, terrific to have um, great um, clinical collaborators and great uh, research mentors um, in the Department of Medicine uh, here at UW as well. So fantastic. We've got um, one early question in the Q&A um, from Dr. Tripti Singh, which was asking a question about, could you comment on some possible reasons why the rate of end-stage kidney disease remains so high in this patient population with lupus? Um, and tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so there could be a lot of, uh, we talked about potential gaps, um, such as um, we are still struggling to get several effective therapies rolling for patients. Um, so that could be lack of, uh, lack of effective therapies could be one. The second we talked about that could uh, lead to um, uh, non-adherence. So if the patients are not taking their medicines, that could lead to gaps uh, in therapy, uh, they lose their response window. And then um, a lot of times there is a lot of heterogeneity that is occurring in lupus and lupus nephritis. So when there is a heterogeneity in presentation, uh, not all patients respond to the therapy in the similar way. And then finally, uh, we uh, uh, as we had discussed that the social barriers uh, play a key role. We have seen a lot of times patients who have a uh, uh, aggressive disease, they also have a lot of other factors that are going on that prevent them from me, uh, coming to the appointments, getting to the infusion center, and that keeps on adding on. So, uh, so all these factors taken together could explain why we are seeing the kind of gaps uh, that we are seeing or the ESKD remaining, uh, risk remaining higher. And then I think um, there is also limitation in biological therapy for patients with lupus and lupus nephritis, if we think about, uh, we have so many therapies for rheumatoid arthritis and in contrasting to that, we just got two FDA approved therapies in the last uh, two years. And before that we had been uh, uh, clinging on to mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide. The final thought uh, on that is uh, Michelle Petrie and Dr. Rovin both pioneers in a lot of clinical trials for lupus and lupus nephritis, they highlighted that maybe the initial standard of care therapy that we just looked at, mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide, we only achieve a renal complete renal response rate of 34 to 35%. So could there be a role of adding those add-on therapies that we think about later if the patient is not responding? Would there be a role to link the biopsy and see if in certain patients we could use an add-on therapy to the standard of care therapy and have better remission compared to delaying that remission. So maybe all these are causes and that could be a strategy to that we could try in our clinics. Thank you. 
Fantastic. You covered a lot of ground there. That's 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 great to highlight. Again, we have a couple new FDA approved therapies that really add on um, or salvage, as you mentioned. Um, I also was going to just point out, too, I, I think it's fantastic, too, that you're using data from Europe on the hydroxychloroquine level monitoring, which hasn't completely caught vogue in the United States. But you're, again, spreading a great word about use of that tool in the United States. So um, so for our internal medicine colleagues, if you haven't seen that used widely, uh, it is just catching on. And Dr. Garg has been a pioneer in defining those reference ranges. So that's great. Um, Shivani, we've got another great question in our, our chat here, which is saying in centers like ours with robust cardiology and primary care, do you envision a model of care that can assist with a ASCBD risk? And then I also ask, what's the role of rheumatology, nurses, social workers, et cetera? So how would you like to address that? So, uh, yeah, definitely it will be very uh, comprehensive to provide that kind of uh, preventive care to our patients. Um, uh, the only thing that we are struggling, and that's why we were looking at risk markers, is to define that subset. Because if we start thinking about our patients, everybody is at risk, but not not everybody is at as high risk that they need to be on those preventive therapies or get um, uh, from a clinic. It might be easier to answer from a clinical experience. So we have young patients and they are already seeing three or four providers at the same time. And then they have four visits, four labs um, or getting labs every three months. So on top of that, if we add more testing when they are not at higher risk, that becomes overwhelming for the patients. So we need to find that subset. And then I think a comprehensive care by adding preventive cardiology or uh, associating with them will be really helpful for patients who are at higher risk and getting that risk controlled with some of the timely risk management therapies. Fantastic. And Shivani, we've got another question in the chat, which is um, any role for nutrition in the development and management of lupus? That's a great question. And there is a lot of research that is going on uh, on nutrition uh, not uh, so. I there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that I can uh, quote here. Uh, there have been role of uh, uh, a lot of studies have shown that was a nice study that was presented in one of the European conferences that looked at. Um, processed foods. And if processed foods are taken in more quantities, it leads to increase in a gut bacteria that is associated with increased lupus flares. So mm -hmm. that study was very interesting. And um, it kind of helps uh, understand that maybe there are some kind of oxidants in the pro uh, processed foods that could be triggering some kind of bacterial response. And those bacteria, given the pathophysiology of lupus, some of the bacterial or viral triggers all already lead to the subclinical autoimmunity in these patients. So that was one um, um, uh, evidence or evidence-based uh, study that I can cite here. But other, in general, uh, studies are looking at if uh, it, more antioxidant um, use of turmeric in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. Uh, so all that data is an omega-3 fatty acid. So that data is still premature, but those are other low benefit, low risk therapies or nutrition wise therapies that their uh, patients are looking into. Um, and specifically, if you're asking for anti-inflammatory diets or uh, keto diets, those kind of diets. So uh, I think data is again like in between, there is some positives, some negatives. What I have seen in my clinics uh, with my patients is that following a certain kind of diet is very hard for young families because kids, uh, um, it's difficult to navigate that. But if we give them just a general introduct, uh, a instruction on maybe less processed foods, more whole, more farm to table kind of uh, uh, presentation, kind of food, then uh, it's helpful. Uh, but I I want to plug one thing. We always say organic farm to table, but a lot of patients are not having the money to buy their medicines. So it becomes more challenging when we start adding such kind of recommendations. So again, we need to like uh, sit down with our patients, try to understand what how they're eating their meals and then simplify it rather than just giving broad groups. Hope I answered the question. That's great, and I think it's good that you, yeah, that your your the evidence is kind of limited right now. So again, uh, tempering that 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 that's great. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Astor asked a question about um, could other non-invasive 
an invasive test like coronary artery calcium also improve? And I, you address this briefly. And he says, what are the differences in risk associations between lupus specifically and lupus nephritis um, to just juxtapose those two? That's a great question. So CT calcium uh, scoring is the rising imaging um, imaging modality to look for cardiovascular disease risk because the uniqueness of CT calcium scoring is the neg high negative predictive value, not just in patients with uh, um, all like older patients, but also younger patients. So the biggest thing in lupus cardiovascular disease risk prediction in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis is that the modalities or the test or calculators that work for older patients do not work for younger patients, uh, especially below 40 years. And a lot of the young, younger patients are experiencing cardiovascular disease events in this population. So that's why the uniqueness of CT calcium scoring is that it works really well for younger people too. And it has a really high um, uh, association of two to threefold uh, with ASCVD risk. So it has a high negative predictive value. Then the second question uh, on um, separating out lupus and lupus nephritis, that's an excellent question. I did not see specific studies, but would love to look into that and we can use our cohort. So I think um, we possibly, uh, possibly will be connecting with Dr. Gaster to hunt uh, on how to do this. Great. And we've got a terrific question from Dr. Laura Zakowski, who, who congratulates you on a wonderful presentation and asked about whether or not you use the teach back method when you're um, talking to patients on patient education about hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Zogowski. Uh, yes. So uh, the way uh, we built this uh, NCQ safe tool, there was a pre uh, a precursor tool for that, where we were uh, trying to understand the barriers patients are experiencing. So we use different uh, strategies and how we train clinicians to use HCQ safe is that when we, um, we show them, it's visually representative, and then we ask the patients to tell us what they understood. Uh, so that that's how we had tested it, and that's how we plan and vision our clinicians to get trained. That not only just discuss with them, but also ask what what this means to them in their own uh, scenario. So just like make it more personalized, so they can see the medicine working for themselves. But that's a great strategy. Fantastic. And we've got a question from Dr. Par Julie. And he asks, um, again, congratulates me on a great presentation and says for patients whose kidneys have failed due to LN, once they get a kidney transplant, is there anything different we need to focus on in taking care of them post-transplant? Excellent question. So uh, a lot of times we think that after a patient is on dialysis or they get their transplant, uh, patients' systemic lupus might not flare or they might go into remission. But there are several studies that have shown that patients can still flare, uh, not as severe flares because dialysis and immunosuppression for transplant takes care of all the uh, most of the um, antibodies, but they could still have mild to moderate flare that could affect quality of life. Uh, so a few things that we could uh, keep into consideration is that hydroxychloroquine, for example, there is data to support that hydroxychloroquine post-transplant improves outcomes and survival in patient with, uh, patients with history of lupus nephritis or lupus. So continuing hydroxychloroquine uh, will be a great strategy for these patients. Uh, the other thing will be uh, strongly encourage patients to still, still see their rheumatologist. Uh, I know their transplant team is the primary team, but still uh, seeing them once a, once a year or, or at least like two times a year is a good idea. And then finally, uh, if for some reason patients cannot be seen, at least getting lupus labs, which is now the quality measures for uh, uh, lupus uh, monitoring, they should be at least monitored for these patients because uh, 12 to 20 percent of patients could have a mild to moderate lupus nephritis flare or a mild to moderate systemic lupus flare. Fantastic. But another question, um, Dr. Uh, Tiffany Lin from Rheumatology asking if you're aware of any U.S. cities or sites that are exploring dairy, dairy interventions in lupus? Um. I know of uh, a, uh, a nutritionist uh, and rheumatologist, so dual MD in uh, um, in Jefferson University, who was working on uh, some nutritional studies. Um, 
in patients with autoimmune disease. So uh, I'm not sure if there is an active clinical trial, uh, but that was one um, person whom I met in one of the conferences. And then um, there might be a trial or two active for looking at diet and mindfulness-based stress reduction programs in patients with lupus and lupus nephritis. Fantastic. All right. And then we've got some lovely congratulations and accolades from the chair of our chief of uh, nephrology, uh, Dr. Suzanne Norby. And, and and Dr. Norby, that goes both ways, that we're thrilled to have great collaborations with nephrology. Um, and uh, Dr. Gark, I think this really, your work really highlights the power of collaborative uh, medicine and collaborative science. So thank you so much. And with that, we're at 9 a.m. And I'll just thank everyone in the audience um, for uh, their uh fantastic questions and interactions today. Shivani, you obviously sparked interest and congratulations on a tremendous body of work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.